We rolling? We're doing good? All right, let's do this thing. Let's go. My name, my name is Dr. Todd Ehrlich, Austin, Texas. And, you know, we're all going through the same thing. It's a tough time right now when it comes to this uh, coronavirus. It's really serious. And then it's also serious politically and all sorts of things. And we're not going to get into those things, but it's, it's tough. It's been, I'll be honest with you. It's been, it's been emotionally draining on me and, and my team. And um, we all need to get through this. And I think as healthcare professionals, uh, we can be leaders in this. And what I mean by that is, is that we already know uh, proper infection control. We know how to use gloves and how not to use gloves and how to wear a mask, how to take it off, those type of things. And so, you know, maybe um, you can educate your family, you can educate people in public nicely, uh, maybe educate people to not throw gloves in the parking lot. I've been seeing that lately. It's been really kind of despicable. But I think as healthcare providers, we need to stick together and uh, help each other along through this because it's really, really tough. It doesn't matter what kind of practice you've got. It's been tough. So anyway, let's work together on that. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm really excited to uh, help with this charity event for this, you know, to fight this coronavirus. And, you know, my friends at the BBA have all, and I have always, what, stop, cut, cut, cut. What do you mean BB? <clears throat> DDA? It says BBA on the card right here, BBA. Oh, DDA. DDA, what is DDA? Digital, digital Dental Academy, okay, got it. Boy, isn't that create Digital Dental Academy. They couldn't have thought of something else? Good gravy, these people are supposed to be doctors. Who are these people? Am I doing this for free? Is this a free video? I hate doing these. Who are these jokers? Let me get out of this. I gotta figure out who these people are. DDA. Let's see, here we are. DDA, the UK's first level seven digital dentistry. I don't even know what that means, level seven. It sounds like a video game. What are they doing over there in the UK? It's level seven. Who are these people? Welcome, yes. Oh, here we go, here's some people. Digital faculty. Professor Adam Nolte. Professor Chris Lefkowitz. Cadididus, Cadididus, I don't know. Professor Nulty, let's see what you got, buddy. You got a BCHD, MJDF, RCS, NPG, CERT, MSE, DIST, just DIST. I don't know what DIST means, but it's DIST. It's probably important, you think? And then he's got a MacAdamed, MacAdamed, and Chris left Cadididus is the, some principle of some, I don't know. I'm not going to read all that. <laughs> That guy does dark magic. I can tell. He's probably the professor of dark magic at the DDA Academy. He's got the little insignia thing and everything. You know that guy's doing dark magic for sure. Let's use the, uh, Professor Patrick Zachrisson. He's from Sweden. He looks smart. That's a nice... See, you can tell a nice guy. That's a nice guy. He's from Sweden. He's, let's see. Oh, he's really big into implants. Of course he's into implants. He's from Sweden. It's like where they invented it. Write that down. You need to know that Sweden is important in dental history. Oh, Professor Quintus von Totter. That guy, he's the real deal. All of these jokers up here, they're on his back. He carries the weight of them, I guarantee you. He, he's, he's a good dentist. Where is he from? Oh, South Africa. He's got a BCHD also. I don't even know what that means. But it's STELL, S-T-E-L-L. -L. Is that stellar? Like you did really good, I don't know. Stellar, or is it still? Like he still has it, like it's about ready to get ripped away from. Hey, go get the donuts like I told you to. I don't have to tell you again, the, the glazed, glazed donuts. All right, where was I? Okay, we're going down the faculty lectures, additional topics. You know, these people are the ones that are actually like carrying these people. They're probably doing all the education. She took a good picture. That's good how they did that. Look how she tilted her head just right. She knew what she was doing. This guy didn't. He's right up against the back of the white drop. You don't do that. Look at that shadow right there. You don't do that. Let's see what's going on here. Let's see who this joker is. Wally Renanine. 
while he's running in a... Oh, no, he's American. What's he doing over there in the UK? I think I know. August? <gasps> Get August on the phone. That guy's fired. Two-timing me on DGA. Would you want to be a professor over there in the UK too, August? All right. Okay, you got the donuts, right? Yes, finally, thank you. More. You need to pour more in there, buddy. I gotta be ready for this emotionally. I'm already mad. Just fill it up. Mary, thank you. Thank you. Okay, you got yours? Here we go. Cowboys do it in a mason jar. This is what's called a mason jar. I was a, I, I had two horses. If you live in Texas and you got two horses, you can call yourself a cowboy, okay? So I had two horses, so don't give me that. I do it in the big mason jar. Okay, you ready? One, two. You're not the boss of me. One, two, three. Dude, these are powder donut. I told you glaze. You don't do powder donut. <clears throat> See, I got this white stuff all over my face now. It's probably all my beard. It's gonna look. It's gonna look like I did drugs. That's why you do glaze donuts. Oh my. Can we, can we do this thing? Hang on, let me get, let me get back to my presentation. DDA. Okay, there we go. Now, let's do this, I don't have all day. There you go. So what I'd like to talk to you today is what I refer to as the story of the mouth. Uh, you know, there's two different audiences that you may be taking pictures for. One is for yourself, you know, clinically, and then also for your patients. And what I think we really do a lot of the times is we get those two confused. Um, our patients may want to see their teeth in one way, whereas dentists may want to see them in another way. And so the t techniques are somewhat similar, and then I think they also vary to some degree. And plus, if you're online a lot and you're looking at a lot of dental photography, you tend to want to copy that and you do it over and over and over again, which is totally normal, the right way to do it. But uh, you know, the story of the mouth, in my opinion, is for the patient, secondarily for me. I need to make sure that they can see what their teeth look like as fast as I possibly can do it in a way that tells the story of their own particular mouth. So um, let's, let's proceed. Now, I've taken tons of pictures. I own a lot of cameras, and I hate to even like pull out all my cameras. I don't even have them all out. I've got one that's just off the shot here filming, filming the cameras, and I've got the one that's actually filming me right now. Um, I use a lot of Sony cameras. I use Pentax. I've got Canons. I've got Nikons. I've got just about every brand. But I, I hate showing this because it's kind of like, well, look how, look how many I've got. Well, I just have a lot of experience in a lot of the brands, and I, I think I have a good opinion on, on all of them. And by the way, when it comes to photography in general, not just dental, there's many, many different ways to do the same thing. So I'm probably going to say a few things you probably don't agree with. You're like, eh, I don't, I don't know if that's probably for me. That's okay. Uh, it's just the way I like to do it, and maybe you can learn something out of this and maybe adapt it to your own methodologies. And uh, you'll see some of that here, here in just a minute. So um, I'm going to show just a little bit of differences in the different cameras, different configurations. So let me get back to topic. Are your pictures artistic or are they functional? Now, what I mean by the two separating those is that artistic is like, I'm trying to make that perfect picture so I can print maybe, uh, maybe put it up in my living room or in the waiting room or something like that. Or is it functional, which means I need to take the perfect consistent picture so that it tells the next 
picture and then the next picture and the next picture, and they all kind of link into themselves and it basically tells the story of the mouth. So I think we need to distinguish between artistic pictures and functional pictures, and there's, there's great differences between them, actually. So uh, we'll, we'll look at this one. Uh, I take a lot of uh, Milky Way pictures, actually. I don't, know, no, I don't know why. Just a few years ago, I was looking online, saw some cool Milky Way pictures, and I was like, I need to learn how to do that. This is really hard. I mean, it is really, really difficult. There is a lot of things to know and how to do it. One, you have to know the weather. I mean, before you even get to the camera, there's a lot of things. The weather, like humidity, dew point. You need to know the moon phase. You need to know where you are on the planet just to be able to see. This is what's called the core of the Milky Way, which is what uh, most Milky Wayers, as we say in the biz, uh, want to uh, capture. So there's a lot of different things. Uh, you have to monitor light pollution. So there's a lot of places in the world you can't even see the Milky Way like this. Now in Texas, I'm fortunate that I can drive out about an hour from my house and start really getting good Milky Way pictures. And this one was uh, about three hours away from where I live in central Texas. And so even this one, in, uh, I took this in October, I even had to know the exact month that I was gonna take this in. So I planned this most of last year because I needed a perfectly vertical Milky Way that has a reflection in this very still water. So I had to find the little lake that I could actually stand in front of to get the reflection of the stars into the water. So a lot of things to think about. Uh, with the camera, which I used a similar camera to this, this is a Sony a7R II, uh, in all manual mode, I had to know the aperture, I had to know the ISO, I had to know uh, the shutter speed, I had to know exactly how steady it was gonna stay on my tripod. If there was any wind, I had to reinforce the tripod legs and everything. So, Long story short, there's a lot to taking this picture. In fact, just side note, this isn't just one image, this is about eight images, which are, it's called a vertical pano, where you take multiple series of pictures up and down so it gets more resolution. And then you use a program like Lightroom and there's other panoramic uh, programs that you can use that, that stitch them and take out a lot of the noise to get, get the picture. So uh, a lot to know when it comes to an artistic picture. Yes, you can take artistic pictures and just kind of snapshot it and they will look good, but when we're talking true artistic level of photography, you gotta get out of the auto mode, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So my Milky Way pictures, landscape astrophotography is what it's called, or portraits. I do a lot of portrait photography. In fact, I do it right here in my little studio in our, in our training center at Digital Enamel. And you know, I would dare say that getting this picture, this beautiful girl, is actually a lot harder and more stressful than all of it that took to get the Milky Way picture. And what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, to be able to get the expression of happy, joy, glee of somebody when they're in an awkward environment, they got lights all around them, their dentist is taking a picture of them, that's weird enough in itself. <laughs> You have to be able to do things to be able to get them in a way that they show joy. And when you're doing that, it's gonna present your dentistry in a way that's never, you've probably never had before because you've been so in line with how we take our pictures in dentistry. So if you're doing any cosmetic dentistry, I'd highly encourage you to start learning how to do portraits. Even if you're not doing them very well, you can at least get some different angles and different lighting when it comes to uh, your restorations. And I'm gonna show here in a minute how uh, you don't need a lot of fancy flashes to actually show texture uh, of your restorations. So let me move on. Uh, this one, uh, I won an award on a website. Uh, this was taken at Big Bend National Park, which is in Texas. I found a little uh, water well and took that picture. That was with the Sony Alpha, Sony A7R II, which is a full frame camera, which I'll explain later. And then uh, the amount of time and an 18 millimeter wide angle lens. And you know, there's, when it comes to photography, there's a lot of equipment, and I'm gonna show you a minute ago, in a minute that um, really the camera is the least important other things that make a better photograph. So what we got here? Oh, I took this one last year. Uh, again, Big Bend National Park. This is called a stacked panorama. Again, just like the one I showed you a minute ago, vertical, but this one's horizontal. So 
uh, the way the orientation of the camera is on this, you actually take it in portrait mode. And then there's a device underneath here that uh, rotates it in a way, you, do it, you can do it manually, but it avoids what's called parallax, which that's a whole nother, another topic. If you want to look up parallax, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So we get uh, a more natural looking uh, panoramic with, with the Milky Way. Again, a lot of things to know on how many images to take, getting the exposure exactly the same so it comes out correctly in the actual artistic image. Uh, I do a lot, oh, this one's kind of cool because uh, uh, this is in La Jolla, California. I take a camera with me always, 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 always. Uh, it's just always in my backpack because you never know what kind of images you can potentially get. And I did a lecture in La Jolla, California very famous uh, scene, and then went down and took some video of the, uh, the seal, the seal beach. So always, I can't stress enough, take a camera with you. In fact, there's a saying in photography, the best camera that you could have is the one that you got on you. So make sure you always have one. And I know we've got our phones, but there's nothing like a real camera with a real lens, keep that in mind. All right, what else we got? Oh, I, I even have another camera, which is similar to my A7R2, uh, but it's been surgically uh, separated, taken out two filters so it's an R, um, infrared camera so it can see colors outside of our light spectrum, and uh, it, it makes some really, really funky pictures. And it is, it's not very expensive to do, to do that to a camera. You gotta have professionals do it, but uh, you can be really, really artistic to do this, and so, this is with my infrared camera with a special filter that's on it, and it just took a flower and made the colors really exciting. So uh, that was with the macro zoom lens. Uh, with that same infrared camera, you can also take really, really cool black and white images. Uh, and with this a special filter that comes with this infrared camera, uh, you can have a blue sky with a white, black and white image. This isn't even Photoshop. There's no, no Photoshop to this at all. It's literally how it goes through the processor. It's pretty cool. I'm gonna get to the dental stuff here in just a minute, okay? Cut, 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 cut. What is wrong with you? Here, give me that, give me that. Yes, okay, are we ready? <clears throat> Oh my God, these people. Get, get yours. Okay, here we go. Ready, Mark? Set, go. It's the donut. I told you. The donut. All right. You okay? No fuzz? Doing all right? You're going to make finish. There you go. Uh huh. There you go. Yeah. I get donut particles on my face here. We're moving. Okay, where was I? Oh, we're getting into the dental stuff. They, I, I know they don't care about Milky Way stuff. And I, Yes, I will get to the dental uh, photography here in just a minute. So let's move forward. So again, I want you to really, really, really consider, are you, is your brain towards artistic pictures or functional pictures? Obviously, in, in the pictures that I just showed you a minute ago, there's a lot to think about. Artistic pictures, what we're going to do is we're going to beeline into very structured images so that they can be consistent for years to come. I'm gonna show you pictures here in a little bit that I took uh, like 17 years ago, and they're still consistent to the time I'm taking pictures to today, which is very important, especially for your younger practices. So let's take a quadrant picture of teeth, and I, I would dare say that a quadrant picture of teeth is the most important picture uh, in a general dentistry practice because you know we're working on posterior teeth all the time and if you can take a good quadrant picture you can talk a lot about the other teeth within that zone rather than just one tooth at a time 
So uh, what I mentioned a minute ago is uh, if, you, if you have this down over the, over the course of years, you'll be able to pull up pictures and they'll tell the story over the lifetime. And this is a really good example. Uh, this young girl in 2006, uh, we took this quadrant picture along with a bunch of other pictures uh, that I standardized a long time ago. Uh, but what happened is, as I do this over the course of years in our recall exams, we can have the same set of teeth framed in the exact same way and relatively the same exposure. There's a little bit of exposure difference, but I could have used a little bit slightly different in the course of six years, who knows. And then, you know, from 2006 to 2019, you can obviously see the changes. The patient can obviously see when she lost her sealant and now she's starting to get decay in here. So it tells the story of her mouth in a way that she, she understands. She understands how this is going to work out for her. She knows that something is degrading, eroding away of her teeth, and there's also something happening in the fissures. And so, you know, and then playing the dentist images. Um, I post a lot online on Facebook on our own website, Digital Enamel. And, <clears throat> you know, dentists want to see certain things. And, you know, if you're wanting to post more and kind of show your stuff, what I'd say is just take more pictures. Take pictures of anything. Take pictures of a block. Take pictures of uh, you doing... Um, uh, you know, you're putting the restoration in or you're sticking it onto the little sticky thing, anything like that, just to add to it, it just gives it a little bit more interesting value. If you're doing digital dentistry at the DDA, which I know you guys are doing a lot of like CEREC stuff and any the other stuff, I'm sure there's some Plan Mecca stuff in there too. But we, you can make screenshots and, you know, you can, you can go through those at different angles. If you're going to do a screenshot, make sure it's the same direction for which the quadrant picture was taken because it will tell the story to the dentist that you're trying to show it to a little bit better. So we did this with the prime scan system, CEREC 5.1 or 2, I don't remember which. Uh, this is Emacs and their uh, Tetric Evo Ceram uh, bulk fill material. And uh, anyway, to keep the consistency from an actual image to a screenshot to an actual image, it just makes it look better and uh, make sure that the rectangles are all exactly the same. Uh, in a little bit on another slide, I'm going to show you uh, which program I use to actually do that. And maybe uh, later in the future, I'll show exactly how to do this through that program. So uh, for you expert photographers, here, sit up here. For you expert photographers, um, this may be a little bit boring, but I encourage you to watch because uh, it's always good to hear these things. And uh, uh, for those that aren't really into photography, these are good things to know so that you can focus on one or all of them. Uh, so there's basically three things to an exposure. There's um, the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. So we'll go over these pretty fast. When you're looking at any camera, it doesn't matter if it's a Sony camera, let's see what we got here. This is a Nikon, I can tell by the way it feels. Uh, Nikon, we have bu buttons and different uh, rotators. And they always have an auto button. I think the more pictures I've taken in my lifetime, the less I use of auto. Auto is just for when you're walking around the streets and you're just snapping pictures or whatever, just trying to get them. Yes, you'll get good pictures and they'll be okay, but they're typically very high in the ISO range, which means how sensitive the sensor is being taken. And it's it, the algorithms that are written in the little program of the camera just for, uh, for the, uh, the auto mode, it usually compensates poorly on one side just to give the Im image that has proper light exposure. And so usually the human can figure it out better than the camera does. But anyway, I would encourage you to get off auto mode. Um, but there's usually a manual mode, aperture mode. Uh, this one's for the um, uh, shutter speed and then a program mode. And so different scenes, users. And, but when you're looking at this, it's very intimidating. A lot of different images in the screen. There's a button here, here, and here. I can show you right now, uh, this Pentax uh, is what I've used for, uh, gosh, I bought this lens and this ring flash in 1998 from uh, Lester Dine. This is before, before digital uh, images. 
And, um, and I'm kind of stuck in this Pentax world, which I'll explain later, just, be, just because of this. So I've used this a lot. I don't even think I've changed the buttons on this, not even one time. I don't even, I don't even know where it is. I'm literally only looking at one thing because when you're taking functional photography, you only need to know a couple things, which I'm gonna go over here in just a minute. When you're doing artistic photography, there's a different um, camera system, my Sony's, and I, man, I know these buttons backwards and forwards. I can be in the dark, taking my Milky Way pictures, I know exactly where the button is so I can hit record or uh, whatever I need. So it's very intimidating. So if you're gonna get a DSLR or a, um, a mirrorless camera, uh, don't fret about how difficult they look uh, because I'm gonna show you in just a minute that you only need to know a few settings on these cameras. Okay, so the ISO, International Organization of Standardization, that's kind of a English from French, um, and then the ASA, these are all based off of the film speed, so before digital x-rays, the actual film that went through the cameras, how sensitive they were to light. So the electronic uh, sensors basically use the same type of numbering system. So the higher the number that goes, the more sensitive it is to light, but the disadvantage of that is the more noise that happens within the picture. Yes, you can see it with the human eye, but you'll see that it's not fuzzy, but there's a lot of granular structure to it because it's too sensitive, okay? So in reality, you wanna use as low an ISO as you possibly can by adjusting other, uh, the other two so that you don't have a lot of noise. So uh, you wanna make sure you're uh, keeping that as low as you possibly can within reason. Okay, the F stop. This, the f-stop is always one that's uh, difficult to remember and it's hard to do because um, it's actually from way back in the 1800s when cameras were first coming around. It's where the f-stop came from. It's an inverse number. But basically the f-stop is with the lens, the aperture. So I'll open this up. So you know when you're, when you're looking into a lens, you can see what's called the diaphragm in through here and, uh, and the blades. <clears throat> As those open up, as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, the f-stop goes lower and lower and lower. As it gets smaller and smaller and smaller in here, so if you were looking inside the lens and it's just a tiny little hole, the f-stop would be very big because it's an inverse number. The other thing to know about f-stop is it, it's a volume of light. I kind of like to think of it as a ball. You only have one ball of light that can go through. Okay, so if the if the uh, f-stop or the lens is op wide open, like really big, that means the ball can go in, but it's really, really flat. It all has to go in at one time. The flatness of the ball is the focal depth. That's how much you can actually get in focus. So um, if your focal depth is too narrow, there will be a lot of things that are out of focus that are just behind and just in front. Like when you're looking at the back of my training room here, that's out of focus, that was by design. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be within the focus range of the camera doing the video right now. And then the rest of that is gonna be out of focus, that's the focal range. Okay, so back to f-stop. As the f-stop gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the ball of light that's coming through gets elongated all the way through. That makes your uh, focal depth a lot more. So you can get a lot more within focus, but it gets darker and darker and darker. So those are things to think about. And the reason why I mention this is, if you're taking pictures of your anterior teeth, and what you've noticed is, the anterior teeth are very much in focus, but all of a sudden the canines, premolars, and molars are way out of focus. That means your f-stop is very low, <laughs> and, excuse me, very high, I'm getting confused on myself, and the, the size is very wide in the, in the lens. So you need to bump it down, which would mean make it bigger and bigger and bigger, the number, so that the focal length will be farther along into it and you can get more things within the uh, uh, focus range. So the f-stop really, really matter, matters. When you're doing clinical photography, you're gonna be changing your f-stop a lot. In fact, that is the only thing I think you should be changing other than the ISO, which I'll mention here in a minute. Okay, so taking multiple pictures quickly uh, on a human in, uh, for clinical dentistry, and you wanna do them fast because 
it's an awkward moment. People are like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And you want to get them done right. They want to be in focus. The exposure needs to be right. And you need to have that camera set up to where you don't have to think about it and look at it. So what you want to have it on is aperture priority mode. That means you're going to control the f-stop. So if I take this Pentax that I use every day, I already know where the button is. I, all of this has already been preset. I haven't changed it probably in years. I'm going to take the picture. I'm going to look at it. What is the... Uh, how much ex exposure am I seeing through, this, through the screen and adjust the f-stop accordingly going up or down and then taking another picture. So you only wanna have to think about that one thing. The other major, major thing that you have to consider is manual focus. Yes, I know, I know your camera has autofocus and it's so great, it's so great. But the problem is, is what's called hunting. So as you're taking a picture, let's say I'm, I'm in on this and I'm going to use auto focus. What it will do is it'll go in and out and kind of in and out. And sometimes it gets it, sometimes it does it. And you're kind of like waiting for it to happen. Well, that's an awkward moment when you're trying to take pictures for the patient. What you do is you set it up in manual focus and every lens and camera has a different way to do that set it in manual focus, and what you're going to do is you're going to basically get in the right zone, and you become the distance. You're basically moving the depth of field into the human or out of the human in a way that you're going to see the focus. And if you have a, most cameras have a half press of the shutter release, half press when you're going in and out, and it hits focus on the teeth, you'll hear the beep, and then you slam it down and you take the picture. So you want to make sure it's done in manual focus in aperture priority mode. That's with all cameras, and I think most people do that. So you can see me as I'm coming in and out, checking the exposure, going in and out. I'm allowing myself to find the focus rather than the camera doing it. After every picture, so there I am, every picture, I'm gonna just check real fast on what the exposure looks like. Uh, I don't need to see the histogram. If you're a photographer, you know what that means. I don't need to see the histogram. I can pretty much see on the back of the screen, is that too dark or is that too light? Because again, my goal is to take a lot of pictures in focus, exposed properly, so we can import them into the computer and then start talking to the pa patient about it. All right, so let's, uh, let's go through all this. Oh, uh, one, other, one other thing to consider. In fact, let's, uh, let me talk about some of these, these cameras here. <clears throat> I, uh, I think the number one thing to consider when it comes to buying a camera system for clinical photography, again, functional photography, is how well it fits into your hand. Um, because these things can be big, and you know that they're in your office in the little nice little metal case and because you, you spent however much money and it's got to stay in the case. No, I have a camera for every operatory and it's in the same place. So all I have to do is stand up, grab it, boom, take the picture. But, um, you know, I'm a fairly big guy. I'm 6'3", hands are pretty big. So I can handle a big, heavy camera, which this Pentax system, which I mentioned earlier, this is heavy. It's really heavy. But it takes phenomenal pictures. And the main reason is because of the ring flash, which I'll explain later. But this is a huge ring flash. And so when I'm in taking the pictures, again, my hand is fairly large. I can hold this and get, hold it steady and do it. Now, if I handed this to, let's say, um, not being sexist or anything, I don't mean to be that, but let's say a woman 5'3", uh, maybe she weighs about 110 pounds, her holding this thing and standing over the patient is going to be very difficult for her. And so if she buys the biggest camera thinking she's going to get the best pictures, but she doesn't use it, that's not good. She's not getting any pictures out of it. So it's, it's a wasted camera. What I would highly suggest you do is you go down to your local camera shop and you start holding them and you and tell them to put a big lens on it. It doesn't have to be the exact lens, but a big lens. So this is a, uh, let's see, this is a, I want to go back to this one. This one's a Canon. So just a simple Canon setup, smaller ring flash. Um, uh, Lester Dine makes this uh, a custom, which I'll explain later. Feels pretty good. It's about the same size as my Pentax, maybe a little bit smaller, but uh, fairly large. Uh, the Nikon, Nikon bodies tend to have this really cool little well that's right next to the lens. And so whenever I've handed these cameras to a small female 
and I tell them, here, which one would you rather get? They always pick this one every single time. And I think what it is is because your their fingers can fit right up into that notch really well and they have better support to it. And then they come in and take their picture and they have control over it. So um, I know we get hung up in our, whether, what do you shoot, Canons or Nikons or whatever, but really the most important thing is um, how well you're controlling it in your clinical operatory. Another thing is, is um, <laughs> yeah, 2020, and I'm pretty into digital dentistry. One of the things that just really irks me to no end is why can't I take a picture, boom, click it, and wirelessly it, goes, it jumps right over to my computer? That just blows me away that we can't do that, but that's that's the nature of things. And you know, e so uh, camera companies do make wireless cards. I, I haven't even seen one lately, but uh, a wireless card, and it will connect to your uh, computer just like my little pointer would. But the problem is this. You take a picture, boom, and it's wirelessly sending. You have to wait and wait, and you look, and you wait, and you wait. Yes, I know somebody's watching this. They've got a wireless card, and they go, you don't have to wait that long. I know, but I don't have to wait at all. The only thing I want to have to wait on is my flash to recharge because I want to take the picture, Boom, see that my flash recharged, come over, boom, hit another one. Flash recharge, boom, hit another one because I need to get these things done quickly because the patient only has a certain amount of um, tolerance for how many pictures we're taking. So anyway, I still think the best thing to do is to uh, use the card into it. Now there is a thing called tethering. Tethering is where you take a cable and it plugs into the camera, and it's a long cable. Portrait photographers, photographers will usually use an orange one, uh, just so that uh, uh, you know it's very visible, so people aren't tripping on it, and they know that it's connected to the camera. And I and I use it. I, I'll use it in some of our portraits. We do a thing called smile coaching, and I want to take a picture of them in their portrait, and then. I want them to be able to see themselves on a screen immediately so we can tell them, hey, this is how you need to smile, this is your left side, your right side. They get instant feedback, but that's a completely different discussion, maybe another video we can do. So tethering is one way to do that. But you have to have special programs to do that. Uh, usually Lightroom will do that, or another uh, company called Capture One, which is really good to take a look at them if you're interested in actually connecting it to your camera. All right. Okay, so then again, the, uh, going back to these. So if you're gonna use the card, the SD card, one of the problems with a lot of the cameras are this. So this is the Canon that I've got. The SD card is in the battery compartment. Okay, which, big deal, who cares? Okay, well, this is the big deal. Take all your pictures, boom, 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 boom. Take it out, now you gotta flip it out, pop it out, and then the card comes out. Well. That's a cheap way, in my opinion, for a camera to not have to make another door. Uh, so my Sony's are on the side, my Pentaxes are on the side, this Nikon is on the side. So after I take my pictures, boom, 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 I hit the button, the card comes out, door shut, I can hand it to my assistant, and she'll start putting the images into the computer. So when you're buying a, a camera, Make sure you're holding it. Is it gonna be ergonomically right for your hand and your strength, basically? And then just keep an eye for the uh, door and where that uh, SD card is, because it's actually pretty important. All right, uh, I mentioned a minute ago, uh, uh, the best camera that you have is the one that you got on you. Yes, that is true. Uh, so years ago, um, I was, you know, like I mentioned, I had my Pentax lenses and everything from the late 90s when I was doing film. And I was using an intro camera and it was like eight grand back there, it was so expensive. In fact, these two pictures right here were from my intraoral camera from about 2000, so 20 years ago. And you know what I dare say? The intro cameras that we have today aren't that much better. They're not, and yeah, I know, there's some intraoral camera guy watching this right now going, ah, no, that's not true. I know that they're better there because ours are in high definition or whatever. Yes, but you're limited by the glass. These aren't, these are the best pictures you've ever seen in an art gallery or anything. We're taking with a camera that's only this big. It just doesn't work that way. Plus the sensor size of those intraoral cameras are small. They, they can't have huge sensors. 
So it's just, and plus they're very wide angle, so they look very distorted and they have a lot of contrast because the light that's coming out is very intense and it's not very soft, it's very hard light. So you'll see a lot of intensities and some of it will be dark and some will be really white. Yes, you can see fractures in teeth and everything. And, and I think intro cameras are, they're great. I think they tell the story, not of a mouth, they tell the story of a tooth. So if you're doing one tooth dentistry, and you're using an intro camera, more power to you. You got the right, you got the right camera because they're, they're convenient. Uh, pretty much anybody can use one. Uh, they're easy to do. You don't need another person to use them. So intro cameras and the, are really good and the prices aren't really too outrageous uh, today compared to 20 years ago. But still, if you're trying to tell the story of the mouth, you need to use traditional macro photography. And so, because we want to have a good quadrant picture that's lined up with the teeth, that's um, within the rectangle, and also in the same depth of focus. You don't want to have something out of focus and then something in focus and something out of focus. So you'll see in a minute in a video on how we do that with a, with a mirror. The other thing is the light exposure. You want it consistent um, and uniform all the way around. That's the reason why we have ring flashes. Yes, and I know you can do the little two things, the, the two flashes on either side, but ring flashes can't be beat because you can actually turn one side off. There's a lot of different type of ring flashes. You can make one side flash and the other one not. Uh, different options with that. But the, but the goal for story of the mouth is to get multiple pictures that have great exposure. All right. So um, where am I? Where, where am I going here? Oh, okay. And then if you're doing, sorry, I lost, lost track. Uh, you're doing any clinical teaching or anything like that. Uh, the good thing is when you're in the heat of battle doing dentistry and you're thinking, man, this is a good one that I'm gonna, I could probably throw in some slides. If you've always taken your pictures the, the same way every single time, then it's not a big deal. Pick up your camera, boom, set it down, and it will tell the story of the, of the, to the dentist on how to get this done. So this was just a, a composite ring, uh, and then uh, Tetric Evo Ceram by Ivoclar Vivident, uh, we restored that with. So anyway, it, it stays consistent through the imaging process. All right, so I'm going to show a video, and yes, in today's day of this virus scare, uh, <laughs> Maybe the uh, uh, protection isn't up to, up to snuff right now, but, you know, I've always looked at it like this. You know, when you go to the doctor and, and they're looking at you because you've got a sore throat, they take the tongue depressor and they stick it in their mouth. They don't have, they don't have gloves on. He's just sticking in there just to take a peek. That's all I'm doing you know, when it comes to this. I just have the mirror, and all I'm doing is pulling the cheek back, taking the pictures. So uh, judge me how you wish. But what I'd like for you to do is at least watch, not just watch me, but I, I'd like for you to watch Cindy, my assistant, because uh, we've practiced this so many times. I've done this thousands of times on patients. Uh, we have this down to a routine. So what we're going to do is we're going to take upper right, upper left, lower left, lower right quadrants. Uh, we're going to do a retracted anterior, which they're right, they're anterior, they're left. We're going to have them open slightly so we can get the incisal edges and then uh, a smile picture. And we're gonna do an occlusal of the maxillary arch, an occlusal of the mandibular arch, and then we're gonna sit the patient up, take a quick uh, patient photo, make the, same, make the same joke every single time. Uh, you'll see it at the very end of the video. But we do all of this in two minutes and 15 seconds. Now, you have to do this with two people. One person, it's not easy, it's difficult because Cindy is actually the more important one out of all this. I'm just like the camera holder. I'm just the camera pusher. She's actually drying the teeth off first. That's number one. You have to dry the quadrant off because you don't want uh, saliva bubbles all over. It always looks weird. Now, it doesn't look weird to you, but it will look weird to the patient when they're looking at their teeth and they've got bubbles all over the place. And you're trying to talk to them about an amalgam and they're wondering why there's so many bubbles over there. Uh, so you want to get the saliva bubbles off. Then the mirror, which is typically a rhodium plated mirror. I know they're stainless steels. I've, I've used all of them. Stainless steel, they're, they're okay, but the, uh, uh, the, uh, the white balance can kind of look a little strange. So I've, went, I've gone back, basically back to our rhodium plated mirrors, just like our dental mirrors. 
So uh, rhodium plate and mirror goes in the mouth. She's blowing air on it because as, as the patient's breathing, that thing fogs up really fast. And the other thing is she's got to angle it in a way and know the picture that I'm about ready to take so that we can manage this really fast. So take a, a look of uh, Cindy here. So we're going to take a series of pictures for you. Um, it's very easy. What we have to do is uh, breathe your nose or just hold your breath as we're trying to interface. If you don't hear it, plug my lens up. Okay, not too hard. All right, open it real big if you want. And I'll blow just a little bit of air. Air off the teeth. The mirror goes in. She's blowing air, light mist of air. Then I'm taking the picture. So we did the upper right. Now we're going to do the upper left. And what I want you to notice how Cindy will switch hands automatically. She's not just doing this for the video. We literally do this every day. Air to keep it dry. I'm in and out with the focus. She's making sure there's nothing wet on the mirror. Now we're going to do the lower right. What I'd like for you to do now is a big smile for me. So while I'm taking the smile picture, Cindy is getting the retractors ready. We want them in a maximum intercuspation position, not towards the front or towards the back. Just get them in the CO spot. So do the right, the anterior, the left, and I'm not trying to get you know um, orthodontic type style or standard images or for the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. This is for the patient, not for another dentist. So our goal is to do fast. Yeah, you don't have to do very hard. We just have two more. So now we're doing two occlusals. Patient is now holding their retractors. And then we're going to do the opposite on the bottom, kind of pull down like you're Down like you're frowning because it'll pull the lips and the cheeks down so you can get the lower arch better. Always checking the exposure. Just have one more. I'm going to take a picture of you. Just put the face with the teeth. Okay. Sit the patient up. You're going to lean back, so change the f-stop so it's not overexposed. You got to take a smile again. There you go, that. Why don't you give me that smile earlier? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Same joke every single time. And I, God bless Cindy for laughing every time I've done that. But uh, anyway, one really cool thing to know is that when you're using a dental-made uh, camera, let's say a specific camera, uh, let's say it's 100 millimeters what I'll show later in the uh, portraits, an 85 millimeter lens is the lens of portraits. So you're almost at that portrait range. So you already have a portrait lens. So what you saw me doing is I'm trying to get as far away from the patient and then taking that picture. And when we put that picture in with the patient, uh, it's not going to look distorted. So that 85 millimeter range is, looks really good for uh, uh, portraits. So I'm going to pop the card out, hand it to Cindy, and then we she'll run it into the program. In our per particular office, uh, we use uh, EagleSoft, and I, I know there's plenty of uh, programs, but the goal is to have all of the images in. Anything that was taken with a mirror, we're going to have them flip, rotate it. There's no reason to crop them because I've taken them in the right uh, frame of the rectangle. So. Again, we're trying to do this really fast. So on some of these images, there's like a little line in here I don't, that was on the mirror. I don't even care. I can, you can always go back and take a picture. So don't feel like it has to be perfect. They're digital. You can do many, uh, many images. If I wanted to get this uh, molar in there a little bit better, I can do that. But at least get them through so you can present them to the patient and then talk to them about their teeth. Now I know on the retracted teeth, I'm not getting like this next one that comes up here in just a second. I know I didn't get all of the second molar and everything. I, again, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for the patient. So at least we can talk about something. If there's something really bad right there, we'll put the, the mirror in the buckle direction and then pull the cheek out so we can get that image. But just for like a new patient exam, it's not really necessary unless there's something really distinct needed to know at that moment in time. Even but uh, the goal is to have all of these pictures in the software so that I can go over the images and then the x-rays at the same time because I am going to now tell the story of their mouth. In fact, 
Cindy actually does this. Uh, my assistant does this to begin with, and then she'll review all of them. And then as I'm, as she's doing that, I'm looking at the X-rays. Come back in, we can talk about the treatment plan. But the the power of this is that you can pop up a quadrant image, and then pop up uh, an X-ray and say yes, uh, you know this. Zirconia crown is this one, um, you know, this PFM crown is this one, this amalgam is in this tooth, and at least they're looking at the same thing, and they're, they're looking at this one probably a lot more than what they're looking at the x-ray, because they, they know images, they don't know x-rays. So if you're trying to point to all these different things in a gray, black, white scale, their, their eyes are going to glaze over. So you want to make sure that they're actually looking at their teeth at the same time. So, uh, story of the mouth, very functional pictures, very fast, very routine, very predictable. The exposures are consistent through each of them, and hopefully you can get that done for many, many years. And so when you load up a patient, uh, say 10 years from now, the picture you take in 10 years is gonna be very similar to the one you took 10 years ago. So anyway, very powerful. Now, uh, just as a side note, uh, when you're taking pictures for dentists, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a whole different ballgame. A lot more consistency, consistency needs to be done because we're so frugal on our, our uh, just our mentalities that they did, did in dental school to us. And so um, it's just a different methodology. The program that I use uh, is called Zara. Um, what you want to look for is a, what's called a vector-based graphics program just basically a fancy way of uh, putting a, uh, an image or an object onto a, a working surface. And then it has infinite zoom, which means you can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and it won't pixelate. Photoshop is not a vector-based program. So this is not Photoshop. This is more of like how you make graphics and things. So like if you're gonna make, like this is our logo for our, our uh, dental practice those type of graphics. They can also use images. So I use what's called Zara, X-A-R-A. It's a Brit British company, actually. Uh, I've used them for, gosh, 2003. I've had just about every generation. Uh, maybe this, that'll be another video where we talk about uh, how to crop everything to get a perfect crop, get them aligned right, making sure that each rectangle is exactly the same. Uh, the proportions are all exactly the same. We can throw a shadow on it. You can do your watermark if you wanted your name across it. You can all be done in uh, Zara. And then the other one to get would be Adobe Illustrator. That's the, uh, the one that 99% of the people uh, use in the world, Adobe Illustrator. All right, so a little bit more story of the mouth. Uh, this lady, she, uh, I did a, like an inlay for her like in 2002, so long ago, I don't even remember. And then... Uh, she left, she moved to another state, never saw her again, didn't even, totally forgot about her. And uh, she calls us about four years ago, I think it was, and said, hey, I loved how the process was, the digital dental part was so cool. Uh, I would like for you to replace all of my veneers. And so seeing a lot of veneers, she had just tremendous erythema around her veneers. Basically what it was was the, um, uh, subgingival margins. It wasn't so much that they were open or anything. It was the emergence profile. So the emergence profile were so f they were so fat subgingivally that the gum tissue just never could adapt to it. It was really bad. They were really really thick. So when we got these off, the uh, the gingiva just wet. It was weird because it was all this curricular fluid that just kept coming out. It wasn't really bleeding. It was curricular fluid. So uh, we saw her on a Monday, and then um, this was her on Wednesday and then she left. We did all of this in uh, one visit. We did 14 units for her. This is um, Emacs. And you know, when it comes to the photography of it, uh, when it comes to the clinical photography, again, functional photography, I'm using my Pentax because that's where I'm married to. Boom, 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 same pictures. I know they're gonna be the same exposure. And then when we come in to do the portraits, I got a whole nother setup when it comes to the lighting and it's on manual focus or manual focus, but on manual mode so I can have control over the aperture, the ISO and everything. You don't necessarily need to have two cameras. You just need to know how am I using the camera for which I've got and then the lighting. Lighting is the most important thing. 
In fact, just the video that I'm doing right now, I've got one, two, three, four, five, I've got about six different lights just to light this up, including the TV. So uh, lighting really, really matters when it comes to uh, portraits. I use the Sony Alpha for that. All right, let's talk, uh, let's go deeper a little bit on, on cameras. So uh, <clears throat> would you cut? Do you have to be on your phone? Why are you on your phone? You're supposed to be looking through the little camera thing right here so I stay in focus. Why don't you stay in focus? <laughs> Just for that. I, would you wake up? Wake up. One more. And I think there's one last donut in there. Yes. All right. Got it, that's right, correct. Okay. Oh my God, these people. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. You're making me sweat. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. You know, maybe the powdered donuts are better. You're right, powdered donuts. No more glazed donuts. Powdered donuts make it more smooth. We gotta make sure we don't have anything on my face. You good? Okay, where are we? Did you cut that out? You better cut that out. You know where to clip it out. Okay, so I'll go back just a quick second and then uh, we'll film that again. So let me go back one slide and then we'll do that again. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> Go. 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 Okay. So the uh, clinical pictures, the functional pictures, are actually done with a different camera, and then a portrait picture is just a different setup. Make sure you know the settings that you're actually using with those cameras. All right, so let's get deeper into cameras, actually. Uh, I laugh a lot of the times because I've got a lot of friends in this digital world, digital dentists. Digital Academy, which is a very cool name, by the way. I think, I think it's very appropriate for this group, just so awesome. But uh, they, they go and they go, oh my gosh, look at the greatest camera I just got. And they go, oh my God, that thing is huge. How are you gonna walk that around in an operatory? I will say this, bigger isn't better when it comes to functional photography. In fact, I think smaller is better. The glass matters more than anything. So a lot of people tend to get focused on full frames, which I'll describe here in a minute. I think your best bang for the buck, and then also the highest resolution that you can get for that money is the APS-C uh, sensor size. So let's, let's go over those. Now, the, the thing is, when you buy a camera, unfortunately, you're married to the uh, lens mount because the way this interfaces with the lenses is specific to the brand. Now, I know there's adapters for the photography people out there. I know there's adapters, but uh, like my Sony system, when I take this out, the interface of this to this is very specific for Sony. And there's some cameras that are uh, uh, compatible across, but uh, you know, you're married to this, because if I ever buy another lens, I've got to make sure that it's Sony compatible. This is a Zeiss uh, 40 millimeter um, lens, so that uh, I'm stuck on this, so I can't take this lens and put it on here. <laughs> So once you get into, let's say, Canon or Nikon, you're kind of stuck into that family just because of the ring mount. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about different sensor sizes. Uh, so full frame, which is my, my Sony cameras, um, the reason why it's called full frame is because it's the, relatively the same size as 35 millimeter. So back in the film day, 35 millimeter was the, 
the standard. And so when they finally made a sensor that was about that size, they called it full frame. So that's where the name came from. Uh, medium format, that's another camera saw. These are big, gigantic cameras. Uh, they have a huge sensor. It's something we will never, ever need in, in dentistry. Uh, but they're mainly used for, you know, when you see the, uh, uh, the advertisements on the side of a gigantic building, those are huge resolution um, prints. And so they need as much resolution as they possibly can. They're probably using a medium format, which actually, ironically, Pentax, which is not a very a widely known brand, uh, they're, they kind of dominate in the medium format range. They've got a great camera in that. But anyway, uh, full frame, the APS-C is a little bit smaller size. There's a micro four thirds, which kind of out of the discussion, that's a uh, Panasonic's uh, sensor. And then we get down to the size of what, like what your cell phone would be. So I don't know where my, oh, my cell phone's in my pocket. Great place for it. So it's, you know, I've got an iPhone 10 or whatever it is, I don't know. It's got the three cameras on it, which is super cool. And I'm taking my pictures and th th it's a great camera. It's something that you walk around with. But again, the sensor size in this and the, the glass in this is so small, they're actually very limited. They're excellent at what they do, but it's very software driven. Not, not such a bad thing, but again, taking just pictures in the mouth with this is going to be difficult because of the uh, focal planes and just the limitations of the glass and the sensor. Yes, I know there's probably somebody out there that's thinking, oh no, I can, I can stick it in their mouth and get great pictures. I get it, you take as many pictures as you want with your phone in their mouth, that's weird, that's weird. Do it the right way, use it with real, real cameras here. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so the full frame system and the APS-C uh, sensors, plenty of resolution. Um, every camera that you see on here is either a full frame or an APS-C. In fact, all of them are APS-C uh, cameras except for my Sony, which is full frame. Again, full frame, in my opinion, is definitely not needed when it comes to digital dentistry. Even if you're doing portraits, you still don't need to do it. All right, so when it comes to cost, full frame cameras, tend to be a lot more, a lot more expensive. Uh, these uh, are prices in US dollars uh, from B&H, which is the largest uh, uh, photography uh, store in the entire world. It's in uh, New York. Uh, the great resource, it's where I buy most of my stuff. Uh, these are prices from about six months ago, so these are kind of off. I'm sure they've changed a little bit, but relatively, a, an APS, or excuse me, a full frame can range from $1,500 to 6,500 $6, US dollars. That's just the, the body, so there's a huge range, but they tend to be more expensive. Sony Alphas, which this is one of them, uh, their uh, main A7 is about 800 to up to their A9, which now they have a new A9 II. Um, You're gonna spend four grand for it just for features. Again, something not necessary for functional clinical dentistry. And then Canon also has a huge, huge range. And what I want you to notice, and it's very difficult to see here, is how big these camera bodies are. This camera body also has the battery grip, I think, on the bottom of it built into it. It's a very, very heavy system. I mean, this is something you've got to have it on a tripod. You're taking landscape pictures and stuff. And so it uh, would be very difficult to do in the mouth. In fact, if you looked at um, just the comparative sizes of some cameras, uh, DSLRs, which means there's a mirror in it that, that flips. So if I take this, uh, my button here. so when you look in a DSLR, you'll see the the the, uh, the mirror in it, and that's what you hear when it when it takes the picture. It'll flap up and it reflects it into the sensor. DSLRs tend to be really big. They have big camera bodies because there's more parts in them. Uh, a mirrorless camera means that it doesn't have that, and you're looking directly into the sensor right here, and please be super careful, like this even makes me nervous. I never let one of my lenses even be exposed, so as soon as I take one off to switch them, it gets covered immediately, so you gotta be in the habit of keeping it super clean. So when you look at um, mirrorless camera bodies versus DSLRs, they tend to be a lot smaller. In fact, these are all wide angle lenses, I think they're about 16 to 35, wide angle lenses, basically they can all take the same picture, but a mirrorless camera, which is the Sony system that I've got, 
uh, is going to be a lot smaller, a lot easier to hold, a lot easier to uh, put on a tripod, put in a backpack, wherever you're going. And then uh, Canon and Nikon are also starting to make their own mirrorless camera systems. So when we're looking at the APS-C format, we've got a lot of um, different brands that we can look at. And, you know, there's really, you know, we've got Canon, Sony, Nikon, Leica, uh, Fuji, and then Pentax, of course. But in reality, we're really kind of focused just on a few of those, not all of them. I, you know, I keep talking about my Pentax. I, I don't even really recommend Pentax. I'm just using them because I've got the lens and the ring flashes, and I'm going to wear, I'm going to use those till those ring flashes die. Um, I've taken thousands, I, I bet I've taken 10,000 pictures out of one of these, and I want, eventually they're just going to die out, uh, but they don't even make these anymore. In fact, ring flashes, believe it or not, are very specific in the market. So dentists want to use ring flashes. There's really no other person that's going to want a ring flash. Even people that are into macro photography, they tend to use a tripod, uh, a macro lens, and instead of a ring flash, they'll use two LED lights on either side to light up the bug or the little flower petals or whatever they're taking a picture of. So they don't necessarily want the flash on here. So they used to, because this is what was being manufactured, but uh, the LED systems uh, that are out now are so, so cheap and inexpensive that they want them off the camera. So this has become more dental specific uh, as the years go on. In fact, that's the reason why I like um, Lester Dine system uh, is that they custom make their own ring flashes. And so they have a Canon and they have a Nikon uh, version for it. Uh, they're also incredibly light. Now, th this is just a pet peeve of mine. You would, you would never know the difference, what I'm getting ready to say, unless you were taking pictures with this and then taking pictures with this to see the difference. Now, when you look at this, the, um, the ring flash on my Pentax is a lot larger. I'm going to get much softer light with this and, and very well exposed. Because this ring flash over here is very small, it's going to be a lot harsher and uh, a little bit more acute lighting. Again, not a critical thing. You would never notice it unless you actually took the same picture with the two cameras and go, which one do you like better? So if you got one of these, you would never even see what I'm talking about. But it also has a cool point flash also, so you can flip this over. Instead of using the ring flash, you've got a good point flash, so you can flip this around. And when you're taking the anterior teeth pictures, flip it around, hit it just on this flash, and you can get a little bit of a contrast so you can see more, more texture with it. So anyway, ring flashes are very dental specific, so a lot of them just, companies just aren't making them anymore. All right, so the, 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 the camera body that I use is from 2010. You can get them on eBay for like 300 bucks. Um, so the, I think the camera body is the least important out of, every, out of all three of these things. It's the lens and it's the ring flash. So the lens, you want a macro featured lens. So typically you want a around a hundred millimeter macro lens. If you can find a macro zoom lens, which means it can go in and out, which means it, it has a range of how far it can see in and out, then it's easier when you're taking the pictures of the patient, you can, you can pull it in and get closer, or, well, excuse me, you can go this way and get closer, or you can pull it out and then take the portrait picture. If you use a dedicated, um, uh, what's called a primary lens, like 100 millimeters, you are stuck with that one length of it and can be very awkward. You may not even be able to get some pictures. You'll have to switch lenses, which you don't want to do that for uh, taking teeth pictures. So anyway, I want you to really focus on these. Uh, spend the money on a good TTL ring flash. TTL stands for through the lens. So basically what happens is the, um, the camera and the, uh, the flash are tied to each other and they, they talk to each other in a split second. So uh, when I'm taking the picture, boom, and clicking it, even though that I forced it to have a certain aperture, how wide open it is, it will compensate in the shutter speed uh, so that it's not overexposed or it's overexposed properly. But what it does is it, the light gets thrown out and then as it's coming back, 
it'll speed the camera up or slow it down and so that you'll get a consistent um, exposure time with it. So you want a TTL ring flash that's made for this particular brand of camera that you're, you're looking for. All right, <clears throat> so we'll move on again. Uh, consistent pictures, again, this was taken with my uh, Pentax. Not a lot of harshness to it. It's very, um, uh, from corner to corner in every direction, it's well exposed. There aren't a lot of shadowing, just, just a good picture. Now, each camera also has a way to compress the image because the file size can be very large. If you're gonna do it in what's called RAW, dot R-A, W, R-A-W, RAW format, that means it's using every pixel of the sensor as part of the file size. So a 16 megabyte file size would be very, very big for a camera, or uh, for a picture. So you wanna compress that. Now, it's usually done in stars, in number of stars. You'll have to go through your menu settings. Every camera is a little bit different on how large they'll be. My suggestion, though, is find out whenever you take a picture, what the file size is and just try to make them about one and a half megabytes. If you're at 1.2, it's probably okay. If you're at two megabytes, that's okay. You just don't want to take a lot of five megabyte images because you're going to load up your server unnecessarily. Because think of it like this, you're actually limited by the screen for which you're going to expose the picture. So our screens tend to be 96 uh, dots per inch. So you, you can take a picture that has way more resolution than what the screen is, but the screen is only going to show the resolution it's got, that's capable of. So you don't need to take them too large. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot more to that, but at least try to make them about one and a half megabytes. That's a good, good size for that. Okay, so a lot of different uh, brands that are on the market. There's just a few that you'll probably... Uh, be focused on. Now, uh, so I'm going to throw Pentax out, even though I love my Pentax cameras, they're so great. Uh, you're just probably just not going to buy those. It's not a well-run company. They've gone out of business a few times. But uh, one thing I'll say about Pentax is that they're uh, usually the initiator of new technology. They were the very first camera company to come up with the digital camera body. And um, but then they go out of business, another company buys them. That's why Ryko, um, the copier company uh, bought them out. Uh, then Fujifilm, uh, my good friend, if, my good friend from Germany, Olaf Schenk, I know you use Fuji. If you're watching this, you keep doing what you're doing, man. You take great pictures, I know you do. You keep using your Fujis, but in general, people are gonna be using something else. And then the Leica, you know, I can only imagine um, uh, uh, Dr. Nulty, I can imagine Dr. Nulty, Professor Nulty, I think he's at the DDA. You know, if he's out at the park with his wife and he's using his little Leica camera and it's wrapped around, strapped around his neck and a little bit of leather, and he's asking, darling, please, please stand over by the daffodils. Yes, please stand over by the daffodils so I can take a photograph of you. Oh, such a great picture, darling. Okay, that's Leica. Leica's a very over priced German camera company. It's for very, I don't know, in Texas language, it's hoity-toity kind of type thing. If you shoot Leica, don't make negative comments. You know what I'm talking about. You go into a Leica store, very expensive. And uh, I'll probably own one at some point, but uh, again, for functional clinical dentistry, definitely not needed for that. So anyway, we're gonna be, we're gonna drop down to three different brands, Nikon, Canon, and Sony Alphas. I hate to say this because I love my Sonys so much. I take so many pictures with them. They come with me wherever I go. Uh, the problem is, is that there's no macro zoom uh, lens for them, and there's no ring flash, a TTL ring flash option for them. So Sonys are literally out of the picture. Can't, I, I, you could probably work something out if you're really dying to use full frame Sony's, but it's way too much of a headache when there's two other companies that already got it all figured out, and that's Canon and Nikon. So, um, you know, Canon system, uh, this is interesting because a good friend of mine, who you'll see here in just a minute, you, this will blow you away, uses a 2005 Canon Rebel XT. It's an APS-C uh, sensor size. It's only 8 megapixel. Again, you don't need a lot of... Uh, pixels to take a really good picture. 
He uses an 18 to 200 uh, Sigma lens uh, with a macro lens, about 400 bucks, and then a Canon TTL ring flash, which is actually a very, very good ring flash. It probably is similar in um, value and the way, how much light it ex can expose uh, as my Pentax, but um, it, they're costly. They're, they're gonna run at least 500 bucks. So, you know, this little setup is my good friend, August de Oliveira setup. And there, I'm telling you, there ain't anybody, again, Texas language here, there ain't anybody that takes more pictures and throws it up on the internet than my buddy, August de Oliveira. And he uses a 2005 camera body and takes amazing pictures. It's very consistent, the exposures are right. I mean, he does a, a great job. So again, the camera body isn't the most important Important thing it's really the glass and the flash to control the lighting so thanks August for all of the great work that you've done uh, for digital enamel and I I really look forward to uh, uh, working with you more and more and more uh, on our endeavors when it comes to digital enamel so I s hopefully you'll you'll stick around okay so uh, if you're interested in the uh, the camera, two of the cameras that I've got here, and I'm, I don't make any money off this, it's just uh, uh, Lester Dine worked out a little deal for anybody that orders through them. If you wanna get one of the Canons or the Nikons with their custom-made ring flash system, if you go to, uh, uh, what is there, uh, dynecorp.com, uh, if you put in a code DE100 for like digital enamel, uh, 100, you'll save 100 bucks if the DDA contacted them, I'm sure they would make their own code for them as well. And what's really nice, um, one, it's a dental oriented company. So they make a lot of camera systems that are made just for dental, which is important. So they understand the kind of pictures we're trying to take. Whereas if you call B&H Photo, who they, you know, mainly doing professional photographers or um, amateurs, they're not gonna know exactly the type of things that we need, but they do. And they also custom make their uh, ring flash systems, which is really cool. So they can walk you down the right avenue. Also, when you, get, when you buy one of their kits, you already get a mirror, you get a SD card, uh, full instructions on where, uh, how things to go. And then they also put a really good guide, usually on their lenses so that uh, it kind of gives you an idea of where you're at in the picture frame. And so you even, it even lists the F stop. So if you don't need, if you don't want to. How did you let the card die? You're supposed to be monitoring these things. And now my TV's all messed up. What's wrong with you? You're supposed to monitor the card and the camera so it doesn't wear out. I don't even know what's going on here. Net, net. Keep the drinks coming, buddy. We gotta get through this thing. Why is this not going? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Let me go back. Because you messed this up. Here, I'm trying to give them a great code where they can save some money, <clears throat> and you let the card run out. I think I was sitting right about there. Seriously? One more, real quick. I don't know if I can do all this. I'm gonna sip this one, get a little dizzy. <clears throat> oh. I don't even know what today is anymore. Is this Tuesday, Wednesday? It's any day. I don't even, I've lost track of days going through this virus thing. Mm. Okay, just a sip. We're not down on this out. I think I can push through. I don't need a donut. <coughs> okay. Right. In and out. So with the DE100 uh, code, you can save 100 bucks at DynCorp. They're great people, and uh, they'll they'll definitely definitely take care of you. Okay, let's move into the next uh, transition and uh, a little bit more on uh, portraits. Uh, I highly encourage you to do a little bit of video as you're doing your portrait photography in just a few minutes. You don't have to do a lot because you only need about 
maybe 10 to 12 seconds of slow motion videography to get a really cool effect. You don't need minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes. You just need one moment where they're pulling their lip back just perfectly, where they're expressing their true emotion about their new veneers or their new bridge or whatever it may be. So uh, don't overdo this. In fact, I would dare say the more you film, the more they start to lock up. So you want to make sure that uh, uh, it's kind of a joyous moment and every, everybody's having a good time. So this is uh, my good friend Lori. Uh, I did some veneers for her and also was her wedding photographer when she got married a couple years ago, which I had a great honor of doing that. So that was kind of cool. But what you'll see is uh, the video as we were doing the portraits and we slowed it down. And, you know, as, as we're talking to her and she's telling us a story, whatever that may be, she's going to naturally pull her lips back in a way that we know as humans that... Uh, she's happier, you know, that she's showing expression and, you know, it just makes, makes it a better situation. And then also in portrait photography, uh, you can get the texture within your shots if you're using a high, high enough resolution uh, camera system. So anyway, I highly encourage you to uh, do video. If you know a little bit about video, you don't need a, a, a big codec. This is just the H.264 codec, which is pretty standard for um, the internet. And if you sh shoot at least at 60 frames per second, you can slow it down to where it doesn't look unnatural. Obviously, if you can do more like 120 frames per second, you can really slow it down. But for what you just saw is really all you need to demonstrate to a patient or you know a video you're, you're making. So um, about 60 frames per second. Okay, so if you're gonna take portraits, there's a lot, of, a lot to this, and I, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, and again, uh, uh, photography is very uh, individualized, meaning some people like to do it one way and other people don't like to do it another way. I'm just showing you some basics. Uh, I think one thing is dentists, we need to consider the fact that we're taking, picture, we're taking uh, portraits for teeth, whereas, Portrait photographers are, photographers are taking pictures for their eyes. And a lot of our camera setups are set up to take pictures and focus on their eyes. And if you've got your, a, a very uh, shallow depth of field and it focuses on the eyes, your teeth can be out of focus. And that's exactly what you don't want. So again, a good reason to be in manual focus. All right, so with that said, <clears throat> are you doing portraits? And this is pretty standard across any, any line. Uh, usually an 80 to 85 millimeter um, lens is what's called the, the portrait lens. And the reason for that is, is you can be a certain distance away and uh, take a picture with this type of lens and the human is not distorted in any way. It, you know, when you're looking at wide angle lenses or very, very uh, zoomed in lenses, there's always some distortion. You may not be able to describe it, but when uh, a lady wants her face to look as good as you want, the last thing you want to do is make it her nose more pronounced, okay? In fact, uh, it's the reason why when you're doing all these other videos online during this, uh, this time and you're watching like all these Zoom pictures and everything, everybody's on their, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the cameras of their computers, which are very wide angle, very close up, and so it distorts things a lot. So anyway, an 85 millimeter lens is really good. If you're into Sony, uh, the Sony G Master 85 millimeter lens is pristine. I absolutely love this thing. It is the most detailed and sharp lens out of anything I've ever seen. And uh, I've just taken some amazing pictures with this. So whatever uh, company you're with, it, at least get a, an 85 uh, prime lens for your camera body. You'll thank me later when it comes to your portraits. So um, I shoot an A7R II. Uh, this gentleman, we did some work on him and did some portraits for him. And what I want you to notice is in the same shot, in the close-up zoom, you can great, get great detail of the eye and also of, of the teeth. Now, in order to do that, you, these are not handheld. You want to be on a tripod or um, I use a monopod. Uh, we do have a, a simple light system. And really, when it comes to portraits, you're really focused on the lighting uh, you know, and you can read plenty online or read books or take classes, and there's different ways to light a female versus light a male. Uh, but in general, you're looking at a few things. One is the key light, the 
K-E-Y, key light, is the light that's really dousing the, the human subject a lot. In fact, as I'm videoing this right now, my key light is right to my right. That's the reason why my, my right side is lit up just a little bit more. Now, the thing is, is if you only do that, you'll have a lot of shadowing on the left side, so you have what's called the fill light. The fill light goes on the opposite side, and they can be in different locations. The reason why I have my fill light right now to this side, because if I had my key light over here, it would blow out my TV screen. So I have to make sure that my key light doesn't get on my TV to blow it out. So uh, there is some maneuvering of the lights um, uh, when it comes to the humans. Obviously my setup right now is a lot more complex than just setting up for the human uh, as portraits. So key light, fill light, and then this is really important. It's called the hair light. And I wish that I respected this more years ago because I was like, eh, hair light, it's not that big a deal. Hair lights matter, especially for females, especially females with dark hair, and you're shooting on a black background. When you can get the top of their head lit up really well, it is a really cool look, and it's kind of amateur if you don't have a, a hair light. So uh, make sure you have those things. Now, as fancy as this looks, and what I've got in my little studio area of our training center, uh, you really don't need a big space to do this because, uh, again, you can look at this online, but the, the physics of light, Actually, the closer the, sub, the, uh, the light source is to the subject, the softer the light will be, because you get a lot of refraction um, and reflection of light when it's very close. The farther away the light source is, the harsher the light will be on the subject. So uh, you want big box lights. So what you're seeing right here are Bowens, which is a British company, and I feel so bad because Bowens went out of business. They were just a a huge icon in the photography world, and uh, they went out of business a couple years ago, I think. So anyway, <clears throat> you can get these light boxes very cheap on Amazon, but I encourage you to go to your local camera shop. They're hurting right now. Help them, support them. Uh, buy some, maybe they're $10 more, but you know, support the local businesses. And basically what you're doing is you're taking a small, uh, uh, very focused light, these are LED lights, so they're constantly on, and you're turning into a big massive light, so you get a lot of spread, and then you put them as close as you possibly can without being into the picture. So you don't even have to spend a lot of money on these, but the point is, is that you've got to have at least three lights. If you wanted to add an accessory light or another light, you may want to have one lower, so as, as they're looking up at you, uh, it's filling in the shadows underneath their chin. Again, there are more books on what I just described and, um, and videos to watch online. I'm not the expert at all this. I just have it set up the way, the way I like it, and you'll, you can figure out what you want as well. Uh, but anyway, it's not a hard setup to do. Now, as far as backgrounds go, black backgrounds are stupid easy. They are easy. It, it is so simple. So I know I've got a, what you're seeing in this picture is a black background, but you don't even have to have this. You can have a black sheet. The trick is just get the human away from the background as far as you can. You don't want it close because if the light hits the human and then hits the background and it's really close in space, it will reflect off the background and it won't look black. It'll actually look kind of gray. And so you'll see the background. So you want separation of the human to the backdrop. So, you know, let's say a couple meters, let's say. Uh, then you won't, it'll look more black the farther away it goes because the light just doesn't have time to catch up to the, uh, the, the shutter speed of the camera. So anyway, you want the human away from the, the background. Now, if you're going to do white, that is really hard. It's, 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 it's exceptionally hard, especially with a group. It's very difficult to do. Um, uh, I, it, I don't encourage you to even try to do this unless you've got a lot of light, you've got a great background uh, that really reflects light really well. Uh, and I know orthodontists, they'll, they'll take the, uh, the picture of the patient with the big light source behind them, kind of like these soft boxes that are around me right now. That's easy. I mean, you can kind of get that. But the problem is, is when you're doing a group picture or you're doing a, a, a full body shot or something like that, you need something big that reflects the light off, especially video, very difficult. So anyway, uh, you have to expose the subjects, but you also have to expose the background and it's usually about two f-stops brighter, so it's very difficult to do. A lot of light has to go into this. If you want a white background, which I think you should because it looks really cool on a website, you may want to have a local photographer, again, local photography, 
so many local business support during this difficult time right now, uh, to help you set that up and then um, use their light sources. So uh, we use these on our, our website. Uh, this is my lovely wife, Christine, and um, we'll put her over here. And there's Hallie, she's my office manager. There's my boss, Cindy, my assistant. And then when we take the group picture, it, it looks pretty cool on the website because usually website backgrounds are white and it kind of looks like that we're just part of the website rather than just a, an individual uh, JPEG or a, what do you call it, a thumbnail. And so, you know, white backgrounds are kind of cool, just difficult to do. All right, um, another little trick or something to at least consider, always image higher. Uh, I'm pretty tall, so I can be higher than most of the people I'm taking pictures of, but I'll even stand on a little step stool or something to get a little bit higher. Now, you don't want to have them looking straight up. That would look ridiculous, but even about 10 to 15 degrees, even heck, even 20 degrees looking straight up like this isn't going to look weird in the picture. It's, we have a saying in, in when we're doing our portraits, it's going to feel weird but it's gonna look right. Just go with that. It's gonna feel weird, but it's gonna look right, which basically means the way you're posing, the way you're standing, the way things are contorted feels weird, but when you take the picture and you look at it, it looks, looks right. So anyway, come up from a higher position so you're coming down on them. And then again, always on a tripod or a monopod with feet. So this is a, a monopod, it's just a big pole that can extend up and at the base of it, there's three legs that go to it so it can uh, hold the weight of the camera as well. It just allows you to hold it still and as you're taking the picture, there'll be more detail. Everything will be in focus that you want, especially the teeth. So when you're taking portrait pictures like we did for her, uh, you can get a lot of your texture shots within the portraits because you're using these big soft boxes that really make things soft and really make some shadowing. So this is her, one of her side portraits here and we can get the texturing for it. Easy. In fact, I, I don't even think about like, oh, I need to set up my texture pictures because they happen naturally in the portrait shots. So it's just something you go through and scroll through and you can see, okay, this is a good picture from the side and uh, shows the texture. But if you wanted to set one up, and I know that there's people watching probably that they've got, they've got their ring flash and they've got the little extra attachment, they've got these big lights that come off the sides and they're great. They're very expensive, but um, you don't need them, especially with the way uh, light technology is today. Ring flash we still need, I think, but um, as far as the attachments, I don't think you need those anymore because, uh, you can get things like this, which are uh, cheap LED lights, and they tend to be true to light, meaning they can get up to like say 5500 Kelvin, and they are um, cordless, so you just have a rechargeable battery, and you can turn that on and attach it to different things, or uh, we, I have a lot of uh, light stands, which are cheap little poles, you can just put something on. You can stick this on, turn it on, and, and turn it up or down, and some will even be uh, bicolored, which means you can have more of a lower Kelvin scale and a higher Kelvin scale. But an easy way to get this done is just take one of these type of lights on a ring, on a uh, uh, light stand or have your assistant just hold it from one side and so let's say 45 degrees from the other direction. You snap your picture but you want your ring flash off because you don't want it to douse it and overexpose it. You're trying to get the shadowing effect. Uh, one cool thing about the um, the dying system that we have has a ring flash and also the point flash over here. So when you're taking the picture, let's say straight into that lateral, you can move this around and force it to just be this side. Um, they turn out okay, but I still like the, uh, the way of doing it like this because this is a much bigger light source and that tends to look a little bit softer. It doesn't look so intense on the, on the highlights. But uh, anyway, that's one, one way to trick to get some of your, your textures. Uh, this was a girl that we did some prepless veneers with, and I literally just turned off my ring flash, turned it off. I held the light around her head like this, and was just taking the pictures from the side, and I snapped a few, made sure they were in focus, zoomed in. Yeah, they look like they're in focus. And, you know, like even in this picture, this is in focus, but the depth of field, her side of her cheek is going out of focus, and it's just kind of a, it's a cool way to take uh, uh, a photo, a picture. Very cool, and so when you're showing it to somebody, 
uh, that maybe you're talking about veneers, then it's, a, it's more artistic rather than just our clinical standard uh, photography. In fact, I dare say that uh, dentists, I think we take smile pictures totally wrong. We take them unnaturally. We take them unnaturally. So the standard picture that we take is straight on. So we're right down the midline. The centrals, the laterals, the canines, everything is even. But the problem is nobody, no human looks at each other like that. We all tend to look from the side. And I say we talk with our laterals or we smile with our laterals. So the lateral, I think, is the, the tooth that's more important to really beeline in on a, on a portrait or maybe even some smile pictures. Because even in these shots, um, when you're talking to this young girl and you're sitting at the table and you're talking, you would never be looking straight onto that person because that's like, I'm scolding you. I'm looking straight at you, letting you know what's going on. But if you're having casual, com casual conversation, you're talking lateral to lateral. And as dentists, we only take straight on. And quite frankly, when a patient looks at it, that doesn't look real. It looks weird. Why would I take, okay, there, there's a bunch of teeth. There's no expression into them. So veneers have a lot to do with emotion. So make sure you capitalize on that. Okay, so the power of video. You'll see how we, uh, we run these. Number she, nine. Yeah, not your teeth. <laughs> Throw the teeth off and then finish the competition. These should be fast, not long. Let them talk, tell them to tell you a story, something funny, and watch how the expression changes on her face naturally. That shot right there is almost impossible to do. Go smile, let me take, a, take your picture. But as they're in video and talking about it, they can really demonstrate their smile in a more emotional way, which I think is uh, much more powerful. So she was telling us a story how she lifted the bar and broke her front teeth, and then uh, we got her fixed up. So I think I took a fairly decent uh, portrait picture. I mean, professional portrait photographers would complain about how I lit up one side more than another, but dentists, we would never know that, and I don't even really care. It's good enough. Got a good picture of her face, good picture of her teeth. But again, even as good as that is, it's still not as good as what she was doing in video because I can't force her to smile perfectly all the time. Uh, some people can do it, others can't. So uh, video is good. Also, don't discount selfies. I know that selfies are kind of our rage right now with all our phones, and we're snapping quote unquote selfies. Uh, there are times when a selfie picture will always be better than your great portrait picture. And so, let's say you do a veneer case or something you want to demonstrate a front teeth, just ask the person, go, hey, take a few selfies, you know, whenever, and, and uh, send them to me. Uh, can I use them? Let me, let me use them. And, what happens sometimes is this. So um, uh, this is one of our good friends, and she's pretty cool. We did uh, some veneers for her. Uh, we used Sarek system, of course. And uh, we used a, an, an Emacs, which some people may not be aware of, but it's called Emacs Opal One, which is very, very translucent, uh, very minimally prepared. These are only about half a millimeter in facial reduction. And what's really neat about this material, you really get a nice incisal edge uh, halo translucency and a refraction of that incisal edge that really bounces that white line off uh, normally, <clears throat> or naturally, I should say. And so we had her come in and we did a lot of portrait pictures. And I, I this is a great picture of her, but for every guy out there, you know that this is a better picture. <laughs> her teeth doesn't, don't show up quite as well, but you know, there's just something about it. And I don't know what, why in the world do ladies feel like they got to take selfie pictures in their car? What is so magical about taking selfie pictures in your car? But they're everywhere. Why is that the case? I don't know. Maybe it's the sunlight coming through the windshield. I don't know. But it's, it's a mystery to me. So I'm going to show you one last uh, case, and then we'll, we'll wrap up uh, my little show. So hopefully you've had a good time through all this. I know uh, the people here, we've had a really good time. And, and uh, <clears throat> this is really for a good cause. And really the, um, the coronavirus affecting the whole world. I, one of the benefits that I think is going to come out of this is that 
we're all a population on this world. And I think, you know, with the internet and social media like Facebook and other platforms, uh, it's easier to communicate and we can be friends. We can, uh, a guy in Texas can be a friend with somebody in Egypt or uh, South Africa or wherever. And uh, it's a different world. And so at a time like this, with this big pandemic, we need to uh, focus on that. And so thanks to everybody that actually is uh, promoting um, our charity for this. So anyway, let's get back to the dentistry. Again, dentist pictures, not, not normal human pictures, straight on smile like this. So dentist like this, but a normal human wouldn't. So again, uh, functional photography. Now you have to remember who the audience is. The audience for me on these images are other dentists. I'm going to make a post on Facebook or I'm going to write an article on uh, our website, Digital Enamel or uh, publish a case in a, in a magazine. And so what I'd suggest that you do, in August, De Oliveira, my good friend, uh, he does this really well. He takes pictures of everything. You can never take enough pictures. And what's neat about this is that you can throw in random pictures, like this is a screenshot of the bridge I was making for her uh, uh, and with, with the translucent block, big deal. Uh, this was a lady that had two Maryland bridges that kept coming off and on, off and on, and so she wanted something more uh, aesthetic and, and permanent wasn't going to come off. Uh, in our veneer class that I run here in, um, at Digital Enamel, I show a technique where you don't have to do all of the teeth. Like um, in traditional dentistry, we, we feel like we have to do all of the teeth and then design them and then, and then mill them. But because it's digital, there's a way to break things up that makes it more efficient with the milling units and everything. So anyway, we broke this up and we used the midline as a, uh, as a stop for the digital dentistry part. So on her left side, you know, these are just screenshots. We did a veneer on one of her premolars and then the bridge, of course. And then a screenshot of the design. Uh, another throwaway picture, but it's something that could be <laughs> put in the publication. Uh, then it milled out, and I just had it on one of our, uh, our desks, and I was like, oh, that's a cool picture. So I just snapped a quick photograph of it just to throw in there. And then just for interest, put the blue Emacs next to one that's already seated and, and uh, fired. And then, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure why this is the case. This isn't a... I don't know, American dentists, if you're watching this, I don't, know, I don't know what the deal with this is. But in the United States, we don't tend to show pictures of the restoration just about to go on. But everywhere else in the world, you see pictures like it's, the veneer is just delicately about to be placed onto the preparation. Why, do, why is that? Why is that the case? So on this one, I was telling my assistant, Cindy, I was like, just uh, help me here. And so she was holding it. She was like, she was like what the heck am I doing? I was just, take, just hold it right there. Take the picture because I wanted to do one. But anyway, you'll have to explain that one to me. But anyway, just an interesting picture as it's being seated onto the preparations. So final restorations into place. Obviously a little laser gingivectomy there. And then uh, a functional smile picture. Again, this is a dentist picture. We are not normal. We're clinicians. Normal people don't look at each other like this. We're going to look at them from the side with the head tilt, uh, the light right up, um, you know, the lateral more pointed towards the teeth. In fact, I think the, the most cosmetic teeth are canine, lateral, central, central, not lateral, central, central, lateral. I think it's like this is the most important direction for smiles. And in certain situations, we really have to uh, focus on that with the patient because a straight on midline uh, direction is not natural. And uh, again, we did a portrait uh, session with her and it literally only took like m maybe 10 minutes at that. And then during a break time, we just ask them to start talking. We'll let them uh, tell some funny story. And we do one from the right side, one from the left side. Again, there's no reason to ever do it from the front because that's not a normal direction for humans. And she, I don't know what she was saying, but it was kind of funny. You know, we'll just watch how her lips drape across their, her teeth as she's drama <laughs> dramatically telling us that story. I mean, it's just a lot more fun and powerful. You can kind of see the texture of your restorations and use that video to uh, demonstrate to other patients. So video is very important. Again, 
in my opinion, the most cosmetic teeth or the most cosmetic direction is the lateral and then splaying from either side from the lateral. So I've had a really good time. Hopefully you have had two. Please donate. And one thing I've got to say to my DDA friends, it was only apple juice. And don't start sending me powdered donuts. It's all a joke. Thank you, my friends. Oh yeah, we